Okay, good morning. Welcome to PINKS 2021. And the first thing I'll say is thank you first to uh, Jess and Amanda um, and all the volunteers that have helped set the, the meeting up and thank you for uh, coming in on a Saturday morning. First of all, I'd just like to say this is our 10 year anniversary of PINKS. And for those of you who don't know what PINKS stands for, I've actually written up the acronym. So when um, I established this group uh, with a couple of very, very uh, dear patients of mine more than 10 years ago, we wanted to encompass within the, the name of the group all the things and characteristics that we wanted for the women um, that were involved in, in this uh, support group. So we wanted it to be a very positive group where there was a lot of encouragement for people. Uh, we initially said young and we were going to have a cutoff age and then I think the, my youngest patient was 75 who said, I feel very excluded. So young at heart <laughs> is what the young means. Nurturing. And I think that's a really, really important word. I mean, well, hopefully we nurture each other within our families and within um, our friendships. But particularly when a woman's going through um, a, a condition such as metastatic breast cancer, they certainly do need a lot of nurturing, both from their loved ones uh, and their treating team. And I think that's a really, really important part of what PINKS does. Um, we couldn't think of another letter that would fit in nicely there, so we've made it kids and family, uh, but obviously we wanted it to be a group where the women felt supported in such a way that they would actually be able to feel that they could uh, encourage their husbands and loved ones to be uh, aware and at peace of what was going on and in, uh, knowing what was going on with their, their illness. And we wanted very much to make this group a group that we support the women, but a flow on effect is that it gives support to your family. And ultimately what the, the group was meant to do was to really give each of you uh, empowerment about your, your journey um, and also strength to face the treatments that you're having or your loved ones are having. So I've actually put down all the other key things and I know that uh, the PINKS group meet about once every two months, every month. Um, and it's great to see that Amanda tells me that there are lots of people that attend now and I, I hope it's a very cohesive group. And it's cohesive where women feel they can share what they're feeling in confidentiality uh, with as little respect for each other's viewpoints and treatments that women are going through and the various stages of their diagnosis with metastatic disease that they've um, uh, experienced. Um, and I think, hopefully, um, I haven't heard otherwise, but that it should be a group where nobody really thinks anything less of another person's viewpoint or the way she deals with her illness because you're all there to support and really nurture and love each other. So, as we enter into our second decade, uh, this year I've done uh, the talk a little bit differently because with Amanda's help, I've really tried to pick some topics which I haven't covered before, but appears to be topics that are of interest to you guys um, when you, when you uh, are meeting with uh, Amanda or some of my other members of my team. Um, so you know that I have a, a big passion for clinical trials. Many of you in the audience have been uh, participants in my clinical trials, not maybe once, but twice and three times. I've got a, my record holder is four clinical trials with me. So what I thought I would do is really try to just give you um, the, the layperson view of what clinical trials do. And I hope what I can uh, achieve in telling you about the um, methods by which we do clinical research in medicine, that it will actually highlight to you the differences between the results that we conclude with our clinical research as opposed to the kind of anecdotal Google type, blog type, uh, kind of Twitter type advice you get about um, healthcare. Um, several people ask me what the difference are between the choices of scans that we use, so I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. I think pertinent uh, to whatever stage uh, of the diagnosis women may be, um, I think a, uh, just a short discussion about what advanced care planning is and why I think it's a, 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 an advantageous thing to have a discussion both between your family but also particularly with your treating um, oncologist. This year's key topic I thought I would pick on, and it may not be relevant to the majority of you, but it's really what I see as a current challenge in management of breast cancer, and that is in uh, managing women with uh, metastatic uh, involvement of the brain. Uh, certainly um, an area of disease now that we see with increasing incidence, um, and I'll come to explain why that's the case. Last year, I think at um, the request of a lot of people in the audience, uh, you wanted to know more about certain drugs, and I think we spent a bit of time talking about um, CDK inhibitors. So what I thought I would do this time at Amanda's suggestion is actually give you some case, um, real case histories of patients who've actually received treatment with CDK inhibitors, just to show you what a difference it actually makes to a person's life and where CDK inhibitors sit 
in the um, armor material of drugs that I use to treat ladies with metastatic breast cancer. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this in a very sort of um, general kind of way. Now, as I've always said in uh, years gone by, I'm going to stop after each section so it can give you an opportunity to ask me questions or tell me things. But if during my slides you've got a burning question or there's something that I'm not very clear about, can you please interrupt me? I'm more than happy to be interrupted. Phase one trials are generally small trials. Phase one trials are trials that are not conducted in every hospital center which does research because it is a very resource intensive um, kind of uh, program where it, uh, essentially what you're doing is you have a uh, agent, a um, pharmaceutical agent that has been identified in the laboratory to be potentially effective for cancer. So yes, there are phase one trials specifically for breast cancer, but often phase one trials involve any patient with a solid cancer, be it lung, breast, uh, prostate or anything else. And essentially, because the laboratory evidence suggests that it is an effective drug in animals and in the petri dish, the first step that has to be taken is to try it out in humans. Now, you can have phase one trials where the, the, the agent is actually given to healthy individuals, but I'm not going to talk about that because it's much more relevant that in patients with metastatic disease, phase one trial drug trials are trying to identify two things. One is in human beings with cancer, what are the potential um, mild, moderate, or severe side effects? So when some people occasionally still use the phrase experimental uh, in terms of being at a synonym for clinical trials, in a sense, it's a bit experimental because this is the first opportunity the drug has actually been used in human beings with cancer. <coughs> the second goal of a phase one trial is to identify which tumor type is most likely to do uh, well and respond to the treatment. Um, so that uh, as the trial has been conducted, they're uh, dynamically evaluating what side effects patients complain of, men, women, with whatever cancers that is allowed into the trial. And the dose of the drug is continually increased in small increments until you reach the dose where you think it is likely to be best tolerated but also with no further serious side effects beyond that dose. And in that period of time while you're collecting information on the, on the cancer patients, you're trying to identify which tumor type is likely to respond well to that drug. Now, um, it is intensive because it usually involves a lot of time for the patient in the hospital. It involves a lot of blood testing. Uh, it involves other tests such as ECGs and x-rays and so forth. Um, and potentially, as I've said, because you're trying to find out what the <coughs> potential side effects are, it can make patients very, very ill, so that um, even after their uh, required visits to hospital, they may need to be readmitted to hospital to manage the side effects. So I think we need phase one trials, because otherwise we never identify what the new agents that we should use moving into the next trials. But the patients that go into phase one trials are essentially patients who've already received all the best possible drug therapies for their cancer types. So we generally don't uh, offer phase one trials to a, a newly diagnosed cancer patient. Um, and it's because patients have already uh, received and benefited or not benefited from the known drugs that they wish to consider being considered for a phase one trial. Phase one trials bore park response rate is usually quite low. So generally, because you're really testing it out in the first instance in patients with cancer, you generally expect a response rate in the order of about 10 to 15%. So when you, if, if you're ever offered a phase one trial, I guess the questions you want to ask is, what are the suspected side effects? Um, and how likely is it that it's going to affect my well-being whilst we're trying to figure out whether it helps me? Phase two trials are larger trials, and as, the, as the, new, uh, uh, the, the name implies, it follows on from a phase one trial. So a phase two trial will be largely re um, restricted to one tumor type. It's very rare that you do a phase two trial in two different uh, tumor types, unless there's a very specific reason. Uh, these are all metastatic patients. So again, these are patients that may or may not have already received um, the, the standard treatment recommended for their type of breast cancer. Um, and it goes, it, it, it's conducted once results are published for phase one trials, demonstrating that the phase one trials have indicated that this drug might be effective in this particular type of breast cancer that the woman has. We know and we expect what the side effects are going to be. So we enter phase two trials with a lot more confidence of how to 
prevent side effects in the women going to the trial, also knowing how to monitor them on the trial. But now we're really trying to see how effective the drug treatment is. By and large, phase two trials don't have placebos. So most women uh, that are offered and men with metastatic disease that are offered phase two trials will be uh, uh, having the confidence that they know that they're going to get the new drug. Not always, because sometimes uh, the drug is um, considered so similar to an existing drug in its formulation, in its uh, activity, that they actually want to try and achieve two goals with the one trial. So there may be occasional trials where a, a, a patient is offered a phase two trial. So again, if you're offered a phase two trial, always ask the question, am I certain that I'm going to get the new drug? Um, if I'm not, am I going to be getting a placebo or am I just going to be the control? I'm just going to get whatever I was going to get anyway and not get the new drug. Um, in this kind of trial, it's really, really intensive and it's very, very important to actually constantly measure how well the cancer is responding. So phase two trials will place a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, the correct frequency of CT scans, MRI scans, bone scans, clinical examination, because it's really crucial for a drug to move beyond a phase two trial that we know very, very accurately how effective it is. And to know how effect, uh, effective it is, you have to measure it. And my next topic talking about scans will give you a little bit of insight into that. Often within a phase two trial, the patient will be given an opportunity to receive the new drug up until such time it no longer is effective. So that's what I mean by time to breast cancer progression. So again, an advantage of being an offered phase two trial is that you may actually get a very, very effective drug three to five to seven years become, before it comes onto the market. Um, and I've certainly got a number of patients that I've managed over the last 20 years who are now alive and discharged and well because they actually got uh, entry into phase two trial and it made all the difference in their lives. They got access to this new drug, they didn't have to pay for it, they got access to it until it either stopped working or until it was actually available on the PBS and they could get it uh, as, a, as a normal part of standard of care. Yeah. When you talk about one tumour type, are you suggesting that with metastatic breast cancer, women can have multiple types of tumour, or are you talking about the organs that it's in when you say one tumour? Probably neither. When I talk about different types of breast cancer, I'm talking about the uh, biological behaviour and characteristic of that breast cancer cell. So largely in breast cancer, we consider that there are three major types of breast cancer. There are those that are triple negative. Oh. So their cancer cells, which are biopsied from the breast or in a, in a distant organ, lacks estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptors. There are those with HER2 positive breast cancers, and it's rare that you would then divide those patients up into whether they've got estrogen receptors or not. So if you've got a HER2 positive breast cancer, irrespective of what your cancer's estrogen and progesterone receptor status is, you're regarded as a HER2 positive case. And then there is the hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, or what we call luminal breast cancers, um, that uh, have will expect to have some degree of responsiveness to anti-hormone drugs, but anti-HER2 drugs won't work in that tumor type. Phase three trials are what makes the difference. And I'm really, really pleased to say that, you know, of about the 1,400 patients that are put onto clinical trials, a large number of women were involved in phase three trials, and their participation made it possible to know which drugs should now be offered to women with breast cancer all over the world. And I think, you know, whether or not women recognize that, that's a big contribution that women in Perth make. If they're part of a phase three trial and they get the drug or they don't get the drug, their involvement in the trial allowed that tr drug to be identified as the best new drug for that type of breast cancer, and then it has been rolled out to um, you know, women around the world. And overall, um, we've been involved in, I think, about four pivotal phase three trials where um, uh, Perth contributed the most numbers of patients to those trials in the entire world. But the benefit to that is more women in WA got access to a new drug before anybody else in the rest of the world, plus were integral in getting that drug listed as the new standard of care for other women. So women involved in those trials should really feel good about that. Phase three trials, uh, for the context of our talk, um, obviously is offered to patients with metastatic breast cancer, but we also do phase three trials in early breast cancer. 
That's how, over the last 20 years, we've been able to understand what drugs are best to use in women who have non-metastatic breast cancer uh, after they've had their primary surgery. Phase three trials, because of the very nature of how important the results are, will often require hundreds to thousands of patients. So it's virtually never ever done in a single site. It might be done in one country, but more often than not, it's what's called a multi-center global international study where there may be up to 400 or 500 hospitals contributing patients to the one single trial. So if you just think about the the dynamics of how to run that kind of trial, it probably starts to uh, uh, explain to you why doing clinical trials requires so much uh, rigor and um, involvement and resources and commitment. Once the trials are done, and I've got to be very honest with you, not all phase three trials are positive trials. Um, I was on the steering committee of one of the largest phase three trials conducted in the last eight years. It included 5,500 women. Uh, and unfortunately, it was a negative trial. Not that the new drug caused harm, but it didn't add additional benefits. So my estimate is probably the company spent in the order of several hundreds millions of dollars to do those trials. Uh, there were no new uh, side effects, so none of the women involved in the trial were detrimentally affected. But their involvement allowed us to understand that this drug does not need to be part of the new treatment given to other women with early breast cancer. So a really important negative result. Lastly, because of the nature of phase three trials and that these drugs are now going to be the standard of care to offer to women and men with breast cancer, there is a lot of um, auditing. And this comes from the health regulatory bodies in each different precinct in each different country. Um, and, tr and drugs will not get uh, reimbursed and put onto um, the, uh, in, in Australia, onto the PBS, until the health regulatory authorities have reviewed all the crucial data and agree with the interpretation and the safety and the effectiveness of the drug. So often when women ask me, I've read a story that this drug is the newest thing for my kind of cancer, when is it gonna be available? And I sort of say perhaps three to five years. The reason is that you've gotta make sure that the data is robust enough and in a big enough group of patients to be put forward for registration to health regulators. Um, Australia is not the fastest country to authorize drugs, uh, but I think the broad uh, availability of drugs that women and men with breast cancer get access to in Australia is, is the same as anywhere else in the rest of the world. And I think the time taken um, and the regulatory requirements is all just part and parcel of ensuring that this is a safe and effective drug to offer patients in Australia. So why do we need to do trials? I'm very pleased that in the last probably 10 years, I haven't had any patients come to me and say, and say I had a chat about this trial you talked to me about with my GP, and they say, I'm just a guinea pig. Uh, I'm just going to be used for experiment. And I'm really, really pleased because I think the wider medical fraternity, including general uh, physicians and family doctors who don't do clinical trials, understand the importance, um, the validity, the safety um, and the usefulness of clinical trials where they will try and do their bit to inform their patients as to why they need to do it. But it's really because we, all of us who do clinical trials have one basic uh, goal. We want to save more lives. We want women to be cured and men to be cured. We want men and women with metastatic breast cancer to be cured, if it's possible, to live longer lives and to be free of the symptoms that progressive metastatic breast cancer causes. So that's the underlying commitment um, that drives clinical research. Secondly, breast cancer, above uh, uh, all other, I think, um, solid tumors, at the earlier stages, had that very um, strong belief that you have to understand what the likelihood of effectiveness is in the laboratory. And so there was a lot of years, a lot of effort, a lot of money spent in identifying molecular pathways, what, what um, drives cancers before you actually put it into to patients as well. And I'm going to, uh, yes? I just wonder, I mean, I'm big on trials myself, but if a trial, say like phase two, includes a placebo, this is practically a death sentence for the person who is now stuck on the placebo. No. 
in breast cancer, and I can say this absolutely without uh, uh, contradiction, is that in, in a phase two trial in metastatic breast cancer that offers a placebo, the only reason to offer a placebo is up to that point, all the laboratory data and phase one data suggests and um, uh, provides the basis for why the new drug might work, all right? But there is not enough biological belief to know that it is actually going to be better. So if you have a drug that you think is safe and you actually believe it may make a difference, if you did a trial where every single patient got the drug, You'll never know whether it did better than the current drug. No, I got that, but that placebo would... So you put the placebo there so we can say, okay, 75 people got the new drug, 25 got the placebo, so we can test if 75 people got better, we knew the new drug worked. But that leaves these 25 people untreated. No. Untreated. No. There are never any in breast cancer placebo-only arms in a clinical trial. So in a phase two trial where half the women get a placebo, it is always a placebo in addition to the best current drug. The treatment group gets the best current drug and the new drug. So we never ever do a placebo only arm within a phase two trial, never. Okay, so it's always every woman in the trial gets what's regarded as the best treatment at that time Half the women will get the new drug, half the women will get the placebo, and both of those agents will look exactly the same, whether it's a pill or a drip. So it's completely ethical. You've got half the women already getting the best treatment, and you're trying to evaluate whether the new drug adds to, helps to, has fewer side effects to the best standard of treatment. So I can guarantee you the only reason where that you may consider a placebo um, arm where you don't do any active treatment is a non-therapeutic trial. So for instance, uh, in the management of sore joints, uh, some people wanted to know whether acupuncture might help, right? So what they did was just give some people acupuncture and some people no acupuncture, but a needle in a non-acupuncture point. All right, so they didn't, not, all these people were having whatever treatments they were, but the only thing that was being evaluated was the acupuncture placed properly or not. But you never have a therapeutic trial with drugs where half or a 25 or whatever proportion of women get absolutely nothing but the placebo, never done in breast cancer. Um, good clinical practice is probably nothing that any of you need to know, but it's absolutely something that all medical practitioners involved in clinical research has to know. And it kind of doesn't really seem all that, you know, um, onerous. What's good clinical practice? I'll come to it in a little bit. But essentially, good clinical practice is an international guideline um, formulation of what is necessary for all participants from the medical side, so medical, uh, so doctors, nurses, research people, pathologists, radiologists, what rules and regulations that those health professionals have to abide by, number one, to be able to say that the trial that they were involved in is robust and accurate, and to make sure that patients have the best safety and care. And it's a huge long list. And I think, um, as Claire, my fellow, will learn, it becomes more and more rigorous the more clinical trials that you do. Um, to do clinical trials, I mean, this might all be stating the obvious, but you actually need committed staff and trained staff. Um, you know, the number of complexities in managing even one patient on a clinical trial involves many, many dedicated hours, uh, understanding of what results mean, um, the, uh, the frequency and speed of entering data so that the data is being collected whilst you're doing the clinical research, um, and it often involves absolutely the need for infrastructure. So like in any big organization, you cannot do clinical trials properly um, unless you've actually got every component of the clinical trials unit in place, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. To do clinical trials, we can't do it by ourselves. So oncologists can't just do uh, clinical trials with the help of their nurses and trial staff. We often rely on the pharmacist, we often rely on the radiologists, and we absolutely uh, rely on the nurses who deliver the treatment for the patients when it's given intravenously. 
And I think the last thing, uh, which I think a lot of junior researchers uh, don't often get taught, is that when you want to think about doing a study, whether it's your own study or you've been invited to be part of a research study, even though the topic of uh, to be research is really interesting, you have to know whether it's feasible. So it's no good being uh, involved in a breast cancer trial uh, that is looking at uh, young patients uh, with the BRCA gene, and it's specifically for that group. When you work within a fraternity, which doesn't see a lot of young patients and don't have a lot of patients already in the system with uh, the, the genetic abnormality. So doing a feasibility before you put your hand up to say, yes, I want to be involved, or even when you have an idea of something that you want to do, you've got to know that you've got the, the patients, the knowledge, the staff, and the uh, infrastructure to be able to do the trial. So there's a lot of preparatory work um, that is necessary. And lastly, I think, again, this may or may not be obvious, but it certainly is obvious to me, it involves a lot more time than just taking care of patients. Not just from the doctors, it involves more time from patients. So any of you who have been involved in any of my clinical trials know, you're here for longer visits, you're here often more often than you need to be, um, and there's a lot more questions asked of you um, than what would normally be the case. And often that puts a, 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 a responsibility on your families as well for transport and, and, and so forth and so forth. So to do good clinical research, you absolutely have to have commitment from everybody. And it's the job of the investigators to convey that to their patients that, yes, we want to benefit you, but we need your commitment um, and your continuity and consistency in being involved. Um, this is just a short list of who are the people involved in trials. So the principal investigator is the, usually the most senior oncologist who understands the biology and who will take on the responsibility for conducting that research. Co-investigators are usually also medical people, but they don't necessarily have to be oncologists. They could be the surgeons or the radiation oncologists. They contribute because they will help monitor patients while they're on the, the clinical trial. I've spoken about the trial staff, and you know my trial teams are, is just the best I believe it's the best in Australia, even though I'm a bit biased. Um, they're dedicated, they're keen, and most of all, they care about patients. So they're there to you know, collect a lot of data from you, but they actually care about what happens to you. And I've had a number of patients involved in clinical trials saying, um, I just love being part of the trial because I feel so supported. I feel so nurtured. I've got so many people on the team I can contact if I want to. Um, apart from you know, the nitty-gritty of doing the trials, we actually need ethics. So no trials largely that we will do for pharmaceutical drugs intervention is ever, ever done without ethics approval. So this is an independent authority. Most of us who do a lot of clinical trials in Australia use a single national ethics group called Belbury, which is based in Adelaide. Uh, and they're made up of senior um, physicians, legal, consumers, um, allied health, who review the protocol and say, do we think this is an ethical thing to do? And they often come back with questions and there's a bit of toing and froing. You, know, you need to change this, make this clearer, otherwise patients you know, will be um, not cared for. So there's a lot of communication and time in preparation. And then obviously we can't do any of this without having good governance. And we're really delighted that uh, we've uh, appointed our first governance officer this year and, and she's a huge advantage uh, and uh, bonus to our, our team, as well as our administration team. People who don't take care of the files and make sure everything's there when I need it, we can't do trials. This is GCP. So again, this might look like a short list of things that you have to do as part of GCP, but you actually have to make sure that all those <coughs> features on the slide have actually been done correctly. So often when doctors are taught to do clinical trials, they're actually taught afresh how to sign their name, how to write the date. <laughs> if you've made an error, you don't scrub it out because you've got to leave what you made the error for legible. So it's like kindergarten. You've got to actually teach all of this over and over again. And sometimes, you know, I put a seven on my, I put a cross on my seven and my team say to me, Ali, that looks like a one and I have to do it again. So, you know, the robustness of the data in any registration drug trial is enormously high. So that that should say to the patient and the community, the results are believable. They've been verified, they've been audited again and again and again by independent people who don't have a monetary interest in the outcome of that trial. So believe it if it's been approved ultimately for use uh, in the community. 
Um, and all of it, you know, again, it's probably obvious that you need qualified individuals, but you actually need training in knowing how to do clinical trials. It's not just something that in medical school you get taught. Uh, and there are some hospitals that don't do a lot of clinical research. So as you're going through your training, um, you may not actually get a lot of exposure to that. But that's one of the things that, you know, we're very <coughs> blessed here at BCRCWA because, as you know, a big focus behind everything that goes behind <coughs> the foundations of what we do for metastatic and early breast cancer is evidence-based research. And so we believe that what we do, what we recommend for you as a group, is really the best thing that could be offered to anybody around the world. Sorry, I'll like yep. um, Just a quick one. Um, it's, it'd be interesting from our perspective to know um, inherently whether you, <coughs> with a clinical trials group, have an issue with trying to find enough people to do in the trials? Is that ever a <coughs> Well, you, if you've done good feasibility prior to being involved in a project, that shouldn't be an issue. But I think just to say to you, you know, I said to you, some of the registration trials involve 400 to 500 hospitals. Now, it may be that one hospital only puts two patients in for the lifetime of that trial. And that happens. So when pharmaceutical companies uh, take on trials, they know who are their high recruiters, and so often you see the same names on the papers, because it's, it's those of us who do a lot of trials. But there are also new centres coming aboard. So you wouldn't expect a new centre with a fairly junior staff and a small number of patient population to recruit as many trials. So um, often it is not, you know, uh, set in stone, but when a, a company is looking at a trial, they'll basically say to the doctor, okay, we'll offer you this trial because we've looked at your infrastructure, we think you can do it. How many patients do you think you can put on? If the, if the investigator says, I think I can do one in the next five years, it's probably unlikely that they'll be offered the trial. Now, that's a detriment to the doctor and to the patients in that hospital. But hopefully, as that doctor becomes busier and, and you know, more patients come ab aboard. So we don't often have problems with, you know, scratching our heads. But there are some trials, because trials are so niche now. Fifteen years ago, we didn't actually know about the three different types, triple negative, HER2 positive, ER positive. So we actually included virtually all comers. Um, so it was very easy. I mean, there were several trials. I put more than 100 patients onto trials. Yeah. Now, the trials are very, very niche. -y. You've got to have triple negative mm. breast cancer and you can't have had any chemotherapy. Or you have to have triple negative breast cancer and it has to be in your brain and you can't have had any chemotherapy. Yeah. So all these criteria means that, you know, if you do your feasibility properly, you should have a good estimation of whether you're going to be successful or not. Determine which trials you're going to pick up to run with that have been done overseas. I decide. <laughs> so, but do you base it on um, how many people will be benefited at the end of the trial, or a very specific, <coughs> you know, hard <coughs> case? Or? So, two two things drive what I regard as a good trial to do. One is that I know the background of the drug, I know the need in that group of women and there's a high probability that that drug will be seen as the new standard of care. Now that's, you, you know, that's with, you can say best guess, but that's still with understanding the biology of the drug. The second reason why you might want, want to do a trial is it's an unmet need. To date, there's nothing enough for that group of patients. So even if you think, mm, you know, there could be some issues with how well it's tolerated, and I'll give you an example of this, um, you know, immunotherapy, all the rage, everybody thinks it's a good thing. Uh, we are recruiting to a quite a niche immunotherapy trial, um, and I know one of the patients is in, in the audience with us, but it has a lot of side effects, a lot, a lot of side effects, so it's, it's kind of tough. Um, so when there's a niche and there's a need, that will often, and if I know that there are patients under my care and around that don't have uh, um, other drug options, we think that's a good reason to do it as well. While you're on immunotherapy, um, just one quick question. Um, is there a typical parameters around that? Say, for example, if my cancer came back and I've already been through the chemotherapy, is there certain criteria around that? What, what, what does that look like to meet that need? Because that's, like you say, a hip and happening yeah. thing. It'd be good to know. It's not so much criteria. It's, some, it's more about um, our current information says immunotherapy probably has the, the greatest benefit in triple negative breast cancers. There is some data to say that it's beneficial in HER2 positive breast cancer, but the HER2 space, as I'll show you in a minute, is a hard 
group of women to get better at what we're doing at because they're the group of women that have really benefited from re from clinical research in the last 20 years. Yeah. It's gone from, you know, almost literally a life sentence if you were told you had metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer to a number of my patients now that I've cured and I've discharged. I mean, that's just a huge speed of development of drugs. So to then add an immunotherapy agent to that yeah. and make it look even better, it's a really, really hard bar to reach. Unfortunately, um, the estrogen positive breast cancers often don't seem to respond as well to immunotherapies. But we are looking into that. Um, now, I really just put this in, not because I want sympathy, but I thought, why not? Yeah, and I thought it's good that uh, Claire's here and, you know, some of my staff are here because, you know, it's not that we want your sympathy, but we really want to know what we do behind the scenes to do clinical research. So what I've listed for you in the little number brackets is how many items are responsible by me or the chief investigator under those different guidelines. And if you think about it, there are 38 criteria that have to be met to ensure that I have provided informed consent to patients. So that takes, I mean, you know, just looking at the things that has to be done, it takes a lot, a lot of time. And look, you know, it's what we know we have to do, so we sort of accept it and try not to complain too much. Um, but, you know, there are times, if, if you're thinking a bit worn down, you're thinking, oh, how many times am I going to be asked this question again? Always remember... I have to do more. <laughs> um, so the role of the principal investigator, um, and this, you know, the, the co-investigators have an important role because when they see patients, how they assess the patient, uh, what remarks they make, what treatment they make, are also inc you know, incredibly important. So I don't want to in any way um, say that that's not important, but at the end of the day, the buck stops with me. So if the pharmacist gave out one pill too little, if the blood test was done five minutes later, if the ECG was only two copies and not three, you know, not done intentionally by anybody, it's me that cops the flag. Thankfully, none of those are major issues. But certainly safety issues have to be le left with the, the medical person that's involved in the trial. So if a patient um, has a side effect and it's not been dealt with or identified, you know, all of that lies in the hands of the doctor, which it does whether a patient's involved in a clinical trial or not. But the other part that the principal investigator has to play is also not just coordinating your team, not just informing your patient, but in large collaborative trials, particularly with a pharmaceutical company, it's the principal investigator that is the person that has to negotiate, you know, finer points and finer details. Something that I don't enjoy doing. That's probably the, 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 the part of clinical research that I, I dislike the most. Uh, but that's necessary. You know, in doing a very complex trial between 500 hospitals with a whole lot of different things, uh, it requires a lot of communication back and forth, time differences, um, you know, Google meetings in the middle of the night to discuss things, review information. So it is, it is a big time commitment. That was the best picture I could find of me um, when I have to sign off. Because what it means is that is during the trial and before a trial can be closed, analyzed, and then put forward for uh, presentation, publication, and health authority approval, the PI has to actually literally physically sign every bit of paper that has been used to collect information on patients. So I generally sign, I would, now that Claire's here, she helps me because she signs a lot of things on my behalf as well. But, uh, you know, probably between the two of us, we probably sign something like, I don't know, 200 bits of paper a week. And uh, apart from that, now in the electronic era, I actually have to go on and sign electronically. And that's not an easy task. They change my username every three months. They change my password every three months. Every company uses a different program with a different way of signing. So all I can tell you is that data sign off gives me that appearance every time I have to do it. And I think probably the last thing I want to say in terms of how important clinical research is for the benefit of mankind as opposed to complementary therapies, anecdotal therapies, and so forth, is that it's robust. Not only has it robustly evaluated whether it's likely to work in the laboratory, it's robustly evaluated whether it works in human beings. More importantly, it's identified what all the potential safety issues are. 
So it's actually not quite true when people say, oh, vitamin C is in oranges. So I get an infusion of vitamin C. It's the kind of same thing. You know, it's a natural product. Not true. When you give high dose vitamin C intravenously, there are major, major uh, potential for side effects with your veins. Um, so, you know, you, if you're going to stick anything into any orifice into a human being, you really need to know that it's going to work and it's going to help the patient and what the potential harm is. And unfortunately, a lot of the complementary alternative therapies don't do that. It's all anecdotal. You know, I've treated 600 patients, they all felt better. I mean, can I just ask a question about that? Isn't part of the problem that those, a lot of those complementary therapies, there's no money for the pharmaceutical companies in doing the trial? So how can you ever get that kind of data on some of the things that might be effective but really need to be proven? Well, yeah, that, that's a point. But if you think about it, it's a two-edged um, sword because a pharmaceutical company is going to benefit if their drug is beneficial. They, every company that is evaluating drug trials uh, for, for cancer patients, let alone breast cancer patients, take a big gamble. They will lose millions, if not billions, if they don't do due process and get good information. So it's not always a win-win situation for pharmaceutical companies. My response when I get asked that question, because I get asked that question a lot, is even if you're proposing and uh, promoting a non-pharmaceutical product, be it vitamin C, turmeric, garlic, whatever, um, there is still avenues to getting research money. All of us work really, really hard. I haven't even mentioned that because I, you know, I don't think that's relevant to you guys, how I try and find money to do all the research. But that's a big, big part of the commitment. So, you know, if you have good biological <coughs> understanding that your natural product is potentially effective based on anecdotal experience, uh, and you've got the know-how of understanding why that drug should help a person, uh, you spend the time in developing the protocol, you spend the time attracting money, and you can do a well-conducted evidence-based trial. The problem is, you know, if you look, I can't know what the figure is, but a few years ago, I looked at how much was spent on alternative therapies for cancer, and it was in like 20 billion. So somebody is benefiting from selling those products. So I, I think it's a completely, um, you know, um, erroneous <laughs> argument to say, we don't have a pharmaceutical company backing us, so we can't do the research. I completely refute that. You've got to have the commitment and you've got to have belief and you've got to believe that it's something that's worthwhile to prove. And I think to say, well, it's, it's natural, I don't have pharmaceutical background, so I'm just going to promote it because I have anecdotal evidence, I think it's completely erroneous. People shouldn't be accepting that that's you know, an appropriate reasoning to do it. Yeah, but isn't there more money in a synthetic drug than there is in turmeric? I mean, isn't this why it would be more difficult to get these science community level research done on some of the more natural therapies, um, whether they're dealing with cancer direct or you know side effects or that kind of thing. There's more money in doxorubicin than there is in turmeric root. So that, wouldn't it be more difficult to get that kind of research done? I say no, because the, <laughs> the uh, monetary um, uh, benefits that you've talked about is for the owner or the patent holder of the drug. And I hope in the preceding trials, uh, slides I've shown you, a pharmaceutical company cannot do uh, the research needed to get their product done unless they've got doctors, nurses, clinical. We don't make money. We get reimbursed for the teamwork that we do, but we don't make benefits from it. So when you say, why can't scientists you know, put their efforts into doing turmeric? Well, I have not enough time to get enough sleep doing clinical research trials just in breast cancer, let alone trying to develop protocols, grant funding for turmeric. Um, and therefore, if, 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 you're a, if you're a person that's a big believer in turmeric, then you go and get the money. If you, and then what you do is you collaborate with people like me. Go and design the trial. I'm always open for collaboration when people have got good, you know, um, sound, rational. I've been approached probably in my sort of research career maybe two or three times with outside parties. Um, they weren't pharmaceutical companies, but they were a, a group with some kind of internal finances. Um, and it really didn't get more beyond an initial, you know, are you interested? Because every question I asked was not dealt with. They just wanted, you know, me to help to get their agent marketed. 
So okay. I get that, but you said that the profit goes to the pharmaceutical company. The equivalent would be, you know, let's stick with the turmeric theme, that would be the turmeric grower would be getting, this is where the profit comes in, okay? The, the Pfizer or whoever, you know, gets the profit from the new drug that comes out, but who gets the real profit for something like ginger or turmeric or whatever? The person who thinks that's a good thing. Benefit is not just money. Benefit is knowing that you've actually helped somebody live longer, cured, live a better life. You know, that might be a little bit altruistic, but I think if you believe in an alternative natural treatment, if you're a real believer in that, you should do the research to get that product on the market or, or used at least without expecting any monetary return. So, the, you know, the ethos is different. If you're not a pharmaceutical company and you're not going to get any monetary benefit from getting turmeric out there and you say, well, therefore, I'm not going to do research, I think that's a wrong <laughs> argument. The reason you want to get tubing out there is you believe it's going to help people, and when it helps people, you're going to feel good about what you've contributed to society. Yeah. So that's how I do it. Sorry, I like yeah. Yeah. But didn't you just say that the trials, like some of the pharmaceutical companies, spent like hundred billion dollars on trials or something? I mean, they take a gamble. They've got a product that they created and they can patent, and if it's successful, they will sell for a lot of money. So they make a financial gamble, but something like this for a big proper trial, where does that money come from? So for, for what kind of trial? Uh, something like a tumor. Right? Okay. Um, tumor. If you've got a good scientific rationale, <coughs> you spend the time to say, I can, I've developed this protocol which is feasible and I've actually got doctors or healthcare practices that will have <coughs> patients to put in the trial, you go for independent grants. There, every country has a number of independent, there's, the Cancer Council has yearly grants. Uh, NHMRC has yearly grants. Uh, BCF, Breast Cancer Foundation, has yearly grants. Um, some of the universities have grants. Philanth philanthropy offer grants. So you've got to sort of be in the know-how. You've got to actually get around and say, well, okay, I'm not going to get money from a pharmaceutical company, but there are a number of independent philanthropic academic groups that if your idea is a good one, you'll get a grant. And I'll come to that. I write a lot of investigator initiated research. I get no money from it because I generally don't investigate a product which I'm going to patent. Some doctors do, but I don't. I have to get independent grants for that. Is that something that we as a group could push forward if there's something that's interesting to... You could. I mean, you know, essentially, for instance, you know, we get a lot of generosity from this group and everybody that supports BCRCWA already. Now, if... And this hasn't been done, up, but it's always I've always said this to... The, the individual person that says, I'm going to give you, you know, $10,000. And, and I always say to them, what area of research or education would you like your, your donation to go to? And I generally get whatever you think you want to use it for. So if somebody, you know, that is part of our um, uh, sort of group says, look, I'm really interested in doing this. Um, I'm going to help raise the money for it. That's the first step. The second step is who's going to write the protocol? Who's going to collect the data? Who's going to meet all the guidelines for GCP? Because you have to, even though it's a commercially available thing, you, if it's going to be used in a therapeutic testing, you have to meet all these guidelines. Who's going to do it? And so you have to find somebody that's going to be the champion. Um, so it's not just about money. You know, The money, I think, is actually the easiest part. So those people out there who think you know, um, <coughs> intravenous venous flytrap is worthwhile, they believe in that product, they should then spend the time and effort to go and get the money to, to evaluate their, their product. I'm going to move on because I haven't even gone on to the next bit. Aline, can I just say one thing though? Yep. You need scientific validation before it gets to that point. Yes. You need due process before Aline even sees it. Sure. So you can't just get a, a bit of turmeric. Someone in the in science lab has to validate that and then it goes to someone like Aline for phase one. So it's not like giving you a, you know, I mean, I guess the thing is, with something like turmeric, where you know that you use it as part of your cooking, um, I mean, I don't know what doses are pushed out to the community, and if there's a big dose difference between what you cook with and what you want to use therapeutically, then it has to be evaluated, very much so. Uh, but if you want to use things like vitamins and so forth within the therapeutic safety dosage, you may not need to have to go through as much of um, you know, what's been said, but you still need to have a good scientific 
reason why you're going to do that because you're going to invest a lot of people's time, a lot of patients' time, and potentially, you know, a grant funding to evaluate that product. So somebody who, and it's usually the person who's committed to that product, has to know the biological basis of why this should be done. Okay. So you've asked all the questions. Okay. <laughs> okay, I thought I was going to have not enough time. All right. Um, I'm going to do this very quickly because I think you probably all may have had experiences with various scans. So I'm just going to show you some pictures just to highlight a few things. So I, my thanks to Linda, um, who is not here today, I think, but she, she did this slide for me. And essentially, this just really tells you what are the sort of um, five different kind of potentially radiation uh, positive uh, scans that we do to measure whether patients are responding to treatment or not. Um, so it goes from x-ray, which has uh, the least radiation in conjunction with maybe MRIs as well. Um, it's fast, but it gives you the least detail. CT and MRIs are fairly similar because they're looking at anatomical structure. They just look a little bit different. A PET scan is completely different. So a PET scan is used to evaluate breast cancer because it's looking at activity in cells that take up a lot of glucose or sugar. Now, on that point, can I just say, sugar does not feed cancer <laughs> in such a way that if you ate a bar of Toblerone, you're going to make your cancer grow that much bigger. Every single cell in your body needs glucose, cancer cells and normal cells. It's a very simplistic thing to think of you, whatever what sugar you put in your mouth is going to find its way through your stomach, through your liver, into your bloodstream, and then go straight into the cancer cell. It won't do that. All right? So yes, glucose does have a higher uptake in rapidly dividing cells, i.e. cancer, but you can't particularly impact on that within a meal because you have something sugary. All right? Um, it is a caution, and certainly in insulin-dependent diabetics and often in oral uh, patients who are on oral hypoglycemics as well, you can't actually do a PET scan um, because you get injected with a big dose of glucose and there's some concerns. Uh, a bone scan is um, a little bit different to a, a CAT scan in the sense it's also looking at activity. It's looking at activity within the bones. And one of the most difficult things about bone scans is that if you've broken your bone, like you fell over, broke your leg, um, and did a bone scan, the break would look incredibly black, incredibly hot, and it's not cancer. So what the bone scan can't differentiate often is what's the cause of the irregularity in that bone? Was it injury? Was it a, you know, a, a fracture or a bruise? Or is it cancer itself? So this is a patient. Okay, so on the left is um, the bone scan, and essentially what I was trying to point out is that little black spot there. Mm -hmm. So there is uptake in the sternum and also in the upper spine and also the lower spine here. You can see all the little black spots, mm -hmm. all right? So we know that this is abnormal. But look at the MRI. That's really abnormal. So this is the same patient, and when you look at the anatomy of the, of the spine, not only can you see the bones, which is these sort of square things here, but this area here, which is all cancer that has eroded the bone and is actually putting pressure on the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't appreciate any of that when you look at the bone scan. So sometimes when patients ask me, oh, Eileen, why do I have to this scan and that scan? It's because the scans give us complementary information. CAT scan here, PET scan here. So um, now I did different cuts, so you'll actually see anatomically they're in different parts. But here is an abnormality, so that is in the right breast, and that's an abnormal area of um, cancer. And it looks white against a black sort of grey background. This is a PET scan showing glucose uptake there and there. So in a sense, you know where the problem is, and so if that disappears, you know treatment's working. But PET scans aren't very good in terms of measuring how much it's going down by. Whereas a CAT scan, if that halved in size, you say 50% response. You can't do that with this. So it might get smaller in yellow uptake, but you can't actually essentially tell what proportion of the cancer killers. So again, information that is complementary to um, the investigator. X-ray CT scan. Again, this is slightly different cuts, but on this 
chest x-ray, you can see uh, the right lung is okay. You can see kind of a lot of black, which is air in it. Left lung looks completely white, all right? So when you examine the patient, you'll probably be able to tell the difference. But on this x-ray, you know there's something wrong with the left lung, but you're not quite sure whether the left lung is full of fluid or whether the lung is being collapsed down. So when you then go to a CT scan, you can see, in actual fact, this was done actually at a different time point to the chest x-ray. So you can actually see there's not a lot of fluid here, but there's a big, huge mass up at the top of the lung. And on a further uh, view of the CT scan, it actually put pressure on the airway to the bottom of the lung, and this whole bottom part of the left lung was completely collapsed. So again, you get different information from an x-ray and a CT. Any questions? <laughs> Moving along. Advanced care planning. Um, this is something which I don't, I'm, I, I actually don't even know. Does everybody know what advanced care planning is? So th uh, this is my definition of what advanced care plan is. So it's the process of planning for your future health care. I have an advanced care plan. I don't have cancer, but I've done an advanced care plan. So in that support, I actually think it's something that whether you, I mean, primarily metastatic breast cancer probably is more relevant than early breast cancer, because if you have early breast cancer, your hopes are that um, you receive the best treatment and you're going to be cured. So you're going to live a normal lifespan and die of whatever you were going to die of. If you have metastatic breast cancer, you know that by and large it's regarded as an incurable disease. It's absolutely a treatable disease, but the vast majority of women with metastatic breast cancer will probably die younger than they should because of that. And so having an advanced care plan, I think, is a really important part. Obviously not the first thing you discuss when you are told you've got metastatic breast cancer, but it's an important part of the conversation between yourself and your partner and family but importantly, between yourself and your treating oncologist and team. Enduring power of guardianship is a bit different because what it's saying is that right now, I know exactly what I want to do with my life. But in the event that I get sick or I'm too sleepy or I'm feeling really, really unwell, I trust someone enough that I want them to be my, um, my guardianship for my health care plan. And that's a good thing as well. Now, obviously, you don't have to discuss that at the at any point. But that's also something to think about. If you've got a loved one that knows what your wishes are, you know they're going to make the right decision for you if you're not in a position to make that decision for yourself. So I've just listed from my point of view why I think it's a good idea for patients because I think it really gives you a very good opportunity. And it's not just a one-time point. You might want to revise what your wishes are as your treatment progresses and as your response progresses and as your cancer potentially progresses. But it gives you the ability to input what your choices are for your care in the event that you'll get sicker and sicker with your cancer. It also allows you to openly and I guess without as much emotion at a time where things are in play to be for you to receive treatment, to have that time and I guess comfort to actually discuss openly with your family how you see your future you know, whether it's better or worse, depending on what the treatment is. I think it also opens up the conversation. I have certainly had many discussions with loved ones where they've said to me separately to the patient, uh, and we just haven't been able to talk about it because I, if I bring it up, it's like I'm taking away the hope. It's like me believing that <coughs> she's not going to respond. And it's a really, really tough call. So I think having that open discussion when things are going well, when you are responding, it's actually probably the most sensible time to have it, okay? Um, and importantly, I think it's, it's also making sure that you have the time to make sure without any confusion what your wishes are if and when you get to the point where you are entering the terminal phase of your disease. We all are going to die, some earlier than others. And I think if you have the opportunity because you've had a diagnosis that may impact on your survival, you want to think whether you articulate it early or a bit later on, but you want to articulate what your wishes are when there comes a point in time where your treating doctor says, I am not recommending more active treatment because it's not going to work, you're too unwell, I don't want to make you feel sicker than you are. 
I want to add into the palliative phase only of your treatment. And I'll just make a point. Please be aware that as an oncologist, and I think I speak across this for all my peers, whenever you treat a patient with metastatic cancer, wherever that cancer is, you are actually providing palliative care from that moment. Yes, as an oncologist, I provide palliative care by giving the best drugs, the best doses, the best monitoring, but I'm trying to palliate the, the symptoms and the harm that the cancer is doing to that patient. So, you know, palliative care is not synonymous with terminal care. Terminal care is at that time and point where there's a very high probability that active treatment isn't going to work and your health is deteriorating and you are likely to die in the next few days, next few weeks, next few months. And there's a big difference between those two components. And it's good for you to be able to say that and know that your family mean that as well. Because again, you know, with the patients I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of taking care of, you know, even with some patients I've taken care of for you know two or three or four years with metastatic disease, there was a bit of lack of clarity because they never talked about it at home. Speaking as a healthcare provider, but again, I think I, I reflect the, the sentiments of a lot of my colleagues, it actually allows me to have an accurate understanding of how much of your illness, how much of your prognosis, how much do you want to know at various times of your illness. And so having that ability to say, I, mean, I know what is potentially up ahead of me, and I want you to tell me at every time point what the options are, what the likelihood of response are, that is a good relationship to have with your treating oncologist. Rather than saying, I don't want to hear about it, just give me what you think is best. Um, I don't want percentages because that will just take away my hope. And look, sometimes that pe people don't want to know percentages, and I, I absolutely respect that. But sometimes you need to at least have a little bit of an idea of what it is that you need to know about so you don't have unrealistic expectations. Uh, and I think one of the things I, I always like to say is that, you know, some patients have really, really strong, long-lasting relationships with their family doctor. And I, you know, I'm a big believer in involving uh, family doctors in, in, to be part of the treating team. And it's always so important that every healthcare provider that manages the one patient, we're all on the same page. We're not telling you slightly different things or giving you the wrong information. And that's such a big part of what we try to do as a multidisciplinary group here at uh, BCICWA. Sorry, just a quick one, Alan. Sorry, I was in part of that think tank about the government's push to, you know, euthanasia, euthanasia as, an as, as an option um, recently. And so obviously that early involvement with the GP was really important. Um, has that sort of taken effect where the GP can get involved now and things you are in that terminal phase where you can make that an option to go out peacefully? Okay, so that you've got a few questions embedded in that. So um, already we involve the GP when we can. There are some uh, uh, patients who uh, have a family practice they go to, but they may not see the same GP. And there are many others who have a dedicated GP, yeah. knows them so well. We yeah, so yeah. In terms of the uh, voluntary um, active, um, uh, the, the euthanasia program, it is going to come into effect, I believe, in the first or second week of July. Now, unfortunately, the information for healthcare providers only just came out about two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and so it's something that I have no doubt will be a topic of conversation in various clinics and consulting rooms for yeah. months to come. Uh, for those of you who know me, uh, I will be very open with you. I am not a proponent for uh, voluntary euthanasia. I actually spoke on behalf of the parliamentary group that wanted to highlight what the potential dangers are. And seeing you've brought it up, I'm just going to tell you why I have the stance that I have. I have absolutely 110% commitment to making sure when I believe that one of my patients is going to die soon, they have a good death. Yeah. I absolutely believe that that is possible in the large majority of patients. And to do that means I know what their wishes are. I know what the concerns the patient has about their loved ones. I know what the patient is most fearful about in the process of dying. Some say it's pain. Some say they can't breathe. Some say I can't do what I normally do. So understanding what is the priority for that patient allows me and my team to, as much as we can, with medicines and strategies and allied health team, meet that patient's need. So in my uh, understanding, there is actually no reason why someone would actually want to be injected or take pills. 
The only reason that you would want to do that is that you, uh, it's very important that you say, I want to choose the time when it happens. Now, I respect that if that's an important part of your belief system. Um, but to be honest, with the review, and there were lots of meetings with a whole lot of different people, both for and against, um, that came to be a very small part of the rationale for uh, the bill. It was more about putting up euthanasia as an option for people to take at a point in time when they had an incurable illness. Because the VAD bill doesn't apply to just cancer patients. It can be for neuromuscular degenerative diseases as well. My greatest fear is that when this bill is active, that you will have a patient newly diagnosed with metastatic cancer, be it breast or otherwise, gets referred to a doctor who is a big believer in, I have treatments to offer you, but is a big believer in, I'm not going to cure you, you're going to ultimately die. It's now legal for me to discuss euthanasia, if that's something that you want. Yeah, they well, no, you're not allowed to. It's very, very clear in the bill. You cannot initiate the conversation. It has to be from the patient. It cannot be from a patient family members. I mean, look, at the end of the day, how do you prove that? You know, you've got to rely on the, you know, the integrity of the people. Um, but my greatest fear is that somebody diagnosed with an incurable illness doesn't get the opportunity to have the best treatment. You know, some of you will know, um, you know, after the first treatment doesn't work, the second treatment may work a bit, then the third treatment, the fourth. So for breast cancer, in my field of expertise, I've got multiple lines of treatment to offer people at different stages and if that's what they want. So it really frightens me to think that there may be a GP who's a big believer in euthanasia, says, okay, well, have your first round of chemo. Oh, you did terribly. It only worked for six months. Your oncologist is offering you another treatment. You know euthanasia is legal now. And it's going to be promoted because there are a big group of, I think, healthcare providers who actually believe in that. So even though it's not legal for them to bring it up, it is going to be part of the conversation. Yes. Um, so my greatest fear is that men and women with potentially incurable cancer won't be offered the best treatment throughout the trajectory of their illness. Yes, and I don't know how to protect people from that. Yeah. Great. I attended an education se um, session about VAD, and one of the things on there was that you had to be dying within six months. What crystal ball do we have? I mean, look, if you think about it, if you've got metastatic cancer um, and you either aren't a believer in conventional medicine or you've had one line of treatment and it didn't work, it's a bit like the uh, terminal illness insurance policies that we as oncologists do all the time. Is life expectancy less than six months? Is it less than 12 months? Well, the short answer is it could be. There might be a 1% chance you'll die in six months, but if there's even an iota of possibility. So that meeting that endpoint is not a rigorous endpoint. So at that point on that insurance policy, you've got to look after the person and say yes. So <laughs> in insurance policy, you, I say yes. Yeah. For allowing the patient to be access to VAD, I don't know whether that's the right thing. And, you know, you don't want to be caught as, a, as a, a doctor who, and I'm sure there will be some doctors who are a bit not sure where they stand. And the patient says, look, I really don't want to do any more treatment. I want to be made eligible for VAD. Can you say I'm going to have a life expectancy of six months? Now, if you care about your patient and you're a bit torn and you don't know what you want to do, you can be swayed to do that as well. And look, you know, every single patient I've cared for till death has a different situation. They have different relationships, they have different loved ones, they have functional families, dysfunctional families, fabulous friends, not so fabulous friends. Everybody is unique, and I hate to think that there is a one option offered that may be misused. And look, one of the things that was a big part of the discussion was, how about that slightly elderly patient who already lives alone? dependent on their children to come and help them. And I've actually seen this over the last 20 years. I've actually had patients say to me, I, look, I'm really scared about dying, but I don't want my daughter to be not working. She's really struggling with the kids and she has to come and see me. If I went faster, it would just make it so much easier for everybody. Mm. And that's heartbreaking <coughs> because those patients that say that to me, it's not their own personal wish that they die tomorrow. 
they're doing it out of love and concern. And then when I talk to the family, they, and, and some of the times the family are there when they say it, they say, Mum, don't be stupid. You've cared for me for you know, all my adult life. You know, I can do whatever it takes to make you have a good death or whatever. But equally, I have family that says, when's, when's mum going to go? You know? I have to get back to work. No, seriously. It, it might give a bit of... But I've seriously had those kind of conversations. And it's really tough. It's a really tough part of meeting all the different components. And I guess, you know, if only one person was coerced into asking for VAD when it wasn't their personal wish and they were... S yeah. subtly coerced into it because of the family, that would be such a tragedy. I knew I was opening Pandora's box when I... <laughs> <laughs> I wondered whether one of you would bring that up. <laughs> Trust Joy. Uh, but uh, it is a, a yeah. really valid and interesting conversation mm. that I'm sure other people in this room... And I think one of the things that those of us who were against the bill felt really that it wasn't addressed by the politicians was that many of the horror stories and some of the horror stories came from the politicians of the loved ones they'd lost you know, to terrible, terrible deaths, didn't have access to good palliative care. They had no palliative care. Or they had, you know, infrequent palliative care. So, you know, we kept on saying, why can't the money that's been spent, the millions that's going to be spent on getting this program, you know, articulated and monitored, there's going to be a special uh, board that uh, you have to report to within 24 hours of a patient indicating to you they want to... Um, take the, the VAD forward. And, you've, and there's a certain time limit. You then have to have you know, two qualified healthcare providers who evaluate that as a consistent thing, blah, blah, blah. They're going to spend a lot of money in getting this operational. And I, I can't believe that, they, that that means that there's going to be more money to put into good palliative care, particularly for people in, in the regional areas or outside the sort of you know, metropolitan area which can get access to the palliative care services that are available. <laughs> I really put these slides in there just so I could have a breather. So I knew, I knew that. Okay, okay. Yes, please. Um, just quickly, is there a tool available that is working through advanced care directives that gives you an idea of the kind of questions that you should be thinking about the answer? Yes, there's a website. Uh, it's going to be, uh, well, it's actually out there now. If you look VAD Western Australia, there's a website which is aimed for uh, patients and the community, uh, and there is a multiple page documents for healthcare providers that we have to read. Um, so if you want to, and there, are, and there are groups, I know that there are a number of the proponents of VAD are setting up meetings around the uh, WA to sort of make people aware that it's there. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Is, yeah, if you just type in advanced, care directive. planning or advanced care directive. There are actually forms that you can get from um, the, the intent. But essentially, it's things like if something acutely unexpected happens to you, are you going to be guided by your treating doctor? Have you discussed the role of CPR intubation? Do you want to die in hospital? Do you want to die at home? At what point do you want to have no more active treatment but good palliative yeah. symptom That's relief? really good questions that you might not think about under your own steam, but if there's mm. something to stimulate you to Yeah, there are. It, yeah. You can start to make those questions. Yeah, there is. Mm. Yes. Just, thank you, Caroline, for sharing your thoughts on the, um, the VD. It, it just makes um, us think a little bit more about that side of things and understanding your perspective of it. I mean, I've already had a couple of talks with patients because, you know, they've obviously been looking at it and one of them was very, very keen. And then we had a, a big, long talk and she said, OK, well, I, can, I'm, I have not seen it from your perspective. I don't believe that there's necessarily a good death. And it was more about I want to be the one to make the decision when I go. And I said, but don't you want to make, have that decision assisted? You know, why would you, I mean, you've, you've had treatment with me for so long to keep alive and well. Why would you want to make that decision without knowing what the prognosis is and what the options are? And, you know, so I think, I think for oncologists, um, certainly within our group here at uh, Hollywood, we're going to have, be having discussions as to there's actually a legal remit that if a patient brings up um, the desire to consider VAD, there's a legal remit that even with my personal views, um, I have to provide information where patients can get it. So I can give... Um, 
the, the website. But fortunately, and this is one of the big things I think we actually got through with my participation, is that there is a clause for um, uh, conscientious objection. So there will be some of us who will, and I, I have nothing to hide. I want to, you know, and I actually have said to my secretaries, you know, if a patient's been referred to me for the first time with metastatic breast cancer, I'm very happy to actually say to them what my stance is. I don't want them to be caught seeing me and then saying, well, but Alan, you don't support me in what I want to do. When I want to die, I want to die when I die. So it's going to have an impact on conversations, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Alan, there's um, a group of hospitals also on palliative care centres um, and they are saying that they won't support this. So it makes it difficult. So there's another palliative care centre that you cannot go to if you want to use VAD because you're going to have to go to another hospital. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I find really, I mean, look, I know that none of you in the audience are suspicious of politicians and you think they're <laughs> real. <laughs> But in bold, in the information that's out to healthcare providers, if a patient dies as a result of VAD, as the doctor signing the death certificate, I am not allowed to put that in. I will be prosecuted if I actually put that as the cause of death. What I have to do is they died of whatever cancer they had, even though it wasn't the cancer that caused that immediate death. And then I've got to report it by another means to another committee within the health department to say, yes, that patient actually died of VAD. And I... I question it. There's no justification for that. If you're a believer that VAD is a good thing for the community, why can't they be put on the death certificate? It kind of says to me that there is some concern about the legal remit if it's challenged by uh, you know, a relative you know, and so forth. So I, I don't understand that. And no one that I've asked a question to can explain to me why that's the rule. So you're saying a little bit of ass covering. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Do you want to know about brain disease? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I preface these next few slides with the challenges, and this is one of the biggest clinical challenges that I'm trying to spend a lot of my sort of teaching, education, and my clinical trial selection on, because this is a huge, huge unmet need, I believe, for breast cancer patients with metastatic disease. So just to show you kind of what the suggested problem is. This is a huge data set that was published, albeit more than 10 years ago, with um, more than 16,000 patients with brain metastases. And what you can see is that it's actually lung cancer that most commonly goes to the brain if you're looking at from people diagnosed with brain secondaries. But breast cancer is up there as a common site that it goes to. If you then look at over 10,000 patients with breast cancer, in the time that they followed up, you know, that sort of 30 years almost, a quarter of their patients developed metastatic disease. Now, if you get metastatic disease, the incidence of brain meds jumps <coughs> up to 14%. And remember, this is a very old data set. So you question how many cases did they actually miss? This is more recent data. This is published four years ago. This is from the USA. What they did was they looked at it from a population base. So they looked at over a, nearly a quarter million of breast cancers that had been diagnosed in four years. The ones that developed metastatic disease are shown in red. And I've split them up into terms of what kind of breast cancer, which is what we talked about before. And one of the things that you'll see is the numbers, the, the blue bars are the ones, the patients who got brain metastases. So they're pretty small, which is kind of encouraging. But if you've got HER2 positive breast cancer, so those are those two, or triple negative breast cancer, at initial diagnosis, so when you first get diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, 9 to 11.5% of patients will already have brain metastases which is kind of, you know, already bad, but I'll show you the next slide. Having said that, one of the things they found in this very, very big study was that if you were over the age of 60, if you had other sites of cancer, and if you had triple negative disease, then your risk of dying, once you develop brain metastases, was statistically significantly higher. Now, you can't control these three factors of when you get metastatic breast cancer involving the brain. 
This is from British Columbia. Again, it's a bit of a, a, um, an older data set, but they did 15 years of follow-up. So now we're looking at covering, <coughs> measuring as many patients as you can who ultimately get brain metastases following their breast cancer diagnosis. So it, the numbers go up dramatically. So at diagnosis, the Canadian data is very similar to the American data. But if you're looking over a 15-year time, looking at what happened to these patients who got metastatic disease, up to 29% of HER2 positive breast cancer patients may get brain involvement, and a quarter of those with triple negative disease can get brain involvement. And even though these numbers are smaller, to say that 11 to 15% of hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer get brain metastases, that's a big concern because it involves a lot, a lot of patients because this group are the commonest types of, um, uh, make up the commonest type of breast cancer. We did a study with a good friend of mine from Sydney a few years ago to look at what the uh, Australian data was. And we looked at um, about 13 years of um, patients between our two centres. We had nearly 5,000 patients between our two centres. And although we saw a sort of encouraging 4% incidence of uh, CNS involvement during that period of time, look, the group who constituted more than half of those who get brain metastases are actually the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative ones. And yet, this is the group that we don't really have any clinical trials evaluating how do we stop this, how do we treat this. You know, many of you will know that a lot of efforts are made for triple negative breast cancers because they have a, you know, traditionally a slightly worse prognosis. Her two positive breast cancer also have a reasonably high incidence of getting brain metastases. But because these women are doing so well, there's a lot more efforts to trying to improve brain metastases care for that group of patients, to, I think, the detriment of this group of patients. So what do brain metastases look like? I think that's pretty obvious. This is a scan that shows multiple brain metastases. This is the same patient, same scan, um, at different cut points of the brain. So huge lesions in the brain. And interestingly, this was picked up because I noticed that she was asking me the same question a few times. And I knew this lady for a long, long time. She had no headaches. She had no stroke-like symptoms. Her vision was fine. Her speech was fine. But she just kept on asking me the same questions a few times, which was just not her. Even her husband didn't notice it. He said, oh, no, she's just being a bit batty. <laughs> That's what we found. Now... An area that is really under research in patients who develop brain metastases are the ones where um, the cancer may not just be in the brain tissue, but are actually on the surface of the brain. So this patient has what's called leptomeningeal disease. So you can see the brain itself is pretty okay. But see this white stuff on the top there? There? Here? That's cancer on the surface convolution of the brain. Better or worse? Worse. I know it seems less than that, yeah. but this often causes a lot more symptoms, and it's really hard to treat. Having said that, I do have some patients who have actually been cured, but many, many more have not been and have, have deteriorated very quickly. So again, it's a huge spectrum of what happens. And again, leptin meningeal disease patients are often excluded <coughs> from clinical trials. One, because their prognosis is so poor, Two, because it's actually very hard to measure whether the drug you're giving is actually reducing it. I mean, that if that reduced by 50%, you can say your drug worked. How can you tell there's a little bit more white or a little bit less white? So unfortunately, women uh, that are found to have leptomeningeal disease, even in a trial that is for patients with brain metastases, are often excluded. And this is really something I hope that we can change in, a, in the months and years to come. Now, the really good news. Brain metastases identified in 2002. Fortunately for this patient, found early. And yes, she's got a little bit up here as well. This was removed. Radiation treatment. This is her scan two months ago. Oh, wow. Cured. Oh. 
So there is hope. Don't think if, you know, if anyone of you or anybody you know has the diagnosis of tumors to the brain that is you know, necessary, that's it. There are situations where proper, aggressive, appropriate treatment can really make a difference in someone's life. So currently, as some of you may know, the major way that we treat brain metastases, if it can't be surgically removed, and it can only generally be surgically removed if there is very few lesions and it's able to be reached by the neurosurgeon. So those are the kind of criteria we're looking at. Uh, or sometimes we have to remove one of the lesions because it's so big, it's going to cause harm to the patient. But generally, the role of uh, treatment is uh, whole brain radiation. And just to give you an idea how many patients require that, there was a very good study published by the Breast Cancer Network from Germany a couple of years ago. They looked at over 16, 000, uh, 1,600 patients with brain metastases from breast cancer. In their study, 10% didn't have any treatment because it was diagnosed um, at a time where the patient was too unwell. 87% of patients who were treated received whole brain radiation. And if you know or you don't know, but whole brain radiation is very effective, but it can have some very, very unpleasant short-term and long-term side effects. Therefore, the radiation uh, oncology discipline has now developed what's called stereotactic, or there's another modality called cybernite. And what this is, is with very um, complex and clever computerization, they're able to uh, send a beam of radiation to one, two, and even sometimes up to five or ten metastases. Now, the Japanese do this a lot, and they're very gung-ho. They'll go up to ten spots in the, in the brain they'll do. In Australia, it's a little bit less. They're, they're, often they don't want to offer this if they are just cherry-picking too many because they basically uh, are not treating the rest of the brain and they're worried that the patient will then get brain metastases in those parts. The problem with uh, oncologists treating brain metastases is that we don't have drugs, many, that penetrate the barrier, the blood-brain barrier. And this is something that, you know, in our development is part of the makeup that prevents us from having toxins go into the brain. So the, the blood vessels that uh, are in the brain have a slightly different permeability to other blood vessels in the body. And many of the drugs that uh, we use to treat metastatic disease outside the brain just don't get into the brain. But more importantly, it's really, really hard to do clinical trials because you know we've got to have enough patients, they've got to be fit enough. Even with um, uh, spread of breast cancer to the brain, we need to develop uh, drugs that are based on whether it's a triple negative breast cancer, a HER2 positive breast cancer, or hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And we need to know how best to measure effectiveness. Lastly, in many instances, patients will also have cancer in other parts of their body. So we can't just spend all our efforts at trying to treat the brain disease. We have to, at the same time, treat the disease outside the brain as well. And that adds another level of complexity. Chair, just one question. If you have someone that has um, metastases in their skull, does that make them more like... No. Okay. Thanks for asking that question. Because often that's thought, you know, when you said, you're told you've got a skull metastasis, the first thing a woman thinks is, it's going to go into my brain. Fortunately, there's a lot of barriers between your skull bone and your brain. It's got to go through about three or four different membranes. Now, I do have patients who started off with a, a lesion in the skull bone, and they actually grew into the brain, but it's very, very infrequent that happens. So don't be scared if you know, you're told that there is a, a lesion in the skull bone, right? because you're not at any particular higher risk of it going into the brain. The higher the risk is basically on the type of breast cancer that you have and where it is and so forth. Now, this is, I just pulled this slide from a talk I gave the other day. So this is not meant for you guys. This was meant for doctors and scientists. But I just wanted to make two points. One is the red highlights all the different drugs for HER2 positive breast cancer patients specifically to help treat brain metastases. So that should be really encouraging. You know, there's been a lot of efforts done both in the laboratory, by pharmaceutical companies and so forth to try and develop effective drugs that get into the brain. Part of the problem, though, is that if you look at the green, within each of these um, published clinical trials, there were different uh, goals of what the doctors were trying to do. So in this first one, um, and I was involved in this trial uh, in, in brief, they were just looking to see whether this, the cancers shrunk, as they did for this one. 
And that isn't necessarily all that important. You know, if the cancer shrinks by five millimeters, it doesn't necessarily mean that that woman is going to live longer and is going to have less symptoms. The most important trials are where you're looking at progression-free survival. That one, that one, and that one. All right. So it's it's important and encouraging to know that we actually have two trials for one for tocatinib, one for naretinib, that suggest that in in that those two trials where in the in the HER2 climb trial, 47% of the patients of that 612 had brain disease. So you know, we were involved in this, so we were really pleased we could offer this trial to our patients. So that's a big, big chunk of patients with brain disease that was actually being part of effective treatment. In the NALA trial, which we weren't involved in because this was just a, a, um, a North American trial, 16% of patients had brain disease, which is still generally higher than most other trials. And they actually found that the patients who received the drug actually lived longer. And that's an important point. Is the drug available in Australia? This one is on a shared care program, about $1,500 per month. This one is being considered for registration, is not, probably won't be available, I would imagine, for another 12 months. Just to give encouragement for women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer, that travels to the brain. We have a number of different drugs that are being evaluated and at the moment, several of these drugs are thought to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So it gives some hope that those other two groups of patients are going to be um, you know, uh, being supported and have effective treatments if they were to develop um, <coughs> brain secondaries. So I guess for you know, a community that's very invested into, you want research to be done in the areas where it's helped. Brain disease needs funding, it needs community, uh, community support, it needs consumer awareness that it's not the end or be all, but it's absolutely an unmet need for metastatic breast cancer. Uh, currently, something in the order of 22% of the patients that I treat uh, will develop brain metastases. And I think you know one of the reasons why that, in a, and compared to 20 years ago, it was about 4% of patients had brain metastases, because women with metastatic breast cancer are living longer. Yeah. You know, it's, they're not. You know, it's not a two-year survival. We're looking at five years, ten years, fifteen years survival. And the longer you live, because you've got your disease controlled in your liver and your lungs and your bones, there's a greater opportunity for brain disease to occur. I do have a question. Um, uh, one of the things I really appreciate about the consultation with you is that even if things are not working, there's always, oh, but I have this week. That's really <laughs> lovely. So I always come up positive, even though I'm cranky that it didn't work. Um, but after a couple of, um, this is not working, this is not working, you still start to wonder, shit, do I have to start making those baby books that have been sitting there for 16 years? Will, there, uh, will you give sufficient warning when things are actually, you you know, I don't have the whole picture, I don't know what else is out there. Will I get enough warning when you... Uh, you From me, I will, and I will try. Sometimes, in retrospect, you might still say, well, Alan, you, I would have liked to have known that a month ago. But, you know, it's a balance. I mean, I think all of you who know me for a long time know, the balance is, I want to give you hope if it's realistic hope. Yeah. I don't want to take away options if it's an option that you would consider. And... Sometimes, even if I know you very well, there comes a point in time where you aren't ready to give up options. I'm suggesting to you you should consider stopping, but you're saying to me, no, nah, I still feel well enough, even if I can have a 10% chance of responding, I still want it. Others will say to me, so a 25% chance of it working? No, nah, not enough. So as much as possible, and I don't have a crystal ball, I have to use you know, my experience, I have to use the scans, the blood tests, to know what's happened with your state of health. And that's probably the most important thing, is if you say to me, I mean, I just don't feel that well. That is probably the most important information that you can convey to me um, that helps me know, okay, we now need to talk about how many realistic options there are and whether not pursuing treatment is a appropriate and reasonable thing to do. I mean, there will be times when patients say to me, and it's after the first, second, third treatment, saying, no, nah, I'm going to give up now. 
And I actually say to them, no, don't give up because those three treatments you went through have kept you going for eight years. I know you're feeling sicker now. And yes, the chances that my fourth drug is going to work is lower. But hey, these are the side effects. And you've said to me, you don't mind losing your hair. You know, you just want me to make sure that your bowels work. And this drug is not going to affect your bowels. <laughs> so for that patient, that's a good option. And I don't want you to miss out on it. You know, whereas others will say to me, okay, I've had five different treatments. I'm still feeling pretty well. I, you're offering me three different options. But, you know, if it's only got a 20% chance of working, and if it's only going to help me live for another four to six months, four to six months is not worth it. You know, I'd rather have two months without visits to hospital, scans, and that's fine. I would never try to talk that person out of saying, no, don't do that, do this. Not to excite all of our imaginations, but can you go ahead and give us what the symptoms of brain metastases would be? <laughs> You know, it's kind of the same question I get asked when a patient finishes her adjuvant chemotherapy with me and they, not, they've been seeing me every three weeks for, you know, six months. Yeah. You're not going to see me for six months. Why aren't you going to do scans? And I tell them and they accept it. Okay, give me just a small list of the symptoms I should be looking at for recurrence. I said, my smallest list is 298 symptoms. I'm not going to give you a list. Give Most, the top, the top, top Okay, the top six, headache, seizure, um, a stroke-like, you know, event, you know, droopy face or can't walk or, you know. Um, sometimes it's actually just your family notice. You're just a bit off. You just, you're not just, you haven't falls, you don't have headaches, but you're just not your usual self. Is that enough? That's only four. Uh, okay, visual disturbances, visual disturbances, and probably get a bit unsteady when you're walking. So a bit of a, you know, a, a, you, a bit, and you keep, you're not necessarily to one side or the other side, but you just trip a bit. You don't have any weakness in your leg, but you're sort of a bit dis discoordinated. That's six, thank you. I'm not going to be ordering more MRI brains in the next month, I promise you, all right? Um, how are we going? Do you want to see case studies of this or do you want to? Okay. Okay, so I know this patient is in the audience. Um, she was 54. She is, well, she's 50, oh well, no, she's 60 something now. 54 at the time of metastatic breast cancer. Very extensive bone disease. You can see on the bone scan, you know, both her um, hips, pelvis, all up and down her spine, uh, and quite a lot of disease on her scan. Uh, presented really with about two months of pain and otherwise reasonably well. No other cancer anywhere else. She was fortunate at that time that I had a phase one trial that was kind of a phase two trial. I won't discuss it, it's too complicated. Where every patient that went into the trial got the drug. Absolutely fabulous trial for her. So she got into the trial, she got the drug with a cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor. Uh, apart from fatigue and some skin side effects, worked for four and a half years, way over what the trial said it should. The median response rate, uh, the, the median progression-free survival for this particular CDK inhibitor was 25 months. She got very nervous at 25 months because she thought any minute I was going to tell it it stopped working, went for four and a half years. So that's the good news. At the time it progressed, her symptoms developed really quickly. It was sort of, she came and saw me a little bit earlier than usual. She didn't actually think she was all that unwell. But I took one look at her. She had lost about three kilos. She wasn't jaundiced, but her liver function tests were a bit abnormal. So I was really worried it had actually got out of the bone. And sure enough, she had liver disease. And over about a week, 10 days, she actually, partly because I think I told her where the cancer was, she became unwell very quickly. To the point, I admitted her to hospital. She was kind of bed bound. She needed two nurses to help her because now she was getting a lot of nausea, a lot of vomiting, a lot of pain. And I said to her, you've got to stop that CDK inhibitor. You've got to have chemotherapy. Uh, and over the course of about three to four weeks, she just turned around. She had chemotherapy for nine months. And at the end of that, went back to normal health. 
Now she's on her second line endocrine treatment and I just saw her a few weeks ago. She's doing really well. So the, 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 the lesson to be learned is that CDK inhibitors, fabulous drugs, absolutely one of the key drugs that have changed lives for women in the last five years. But it's not the end or be all. There is still a role for chemotherapy. And when used at the right time with the right understanding, it can just take women out of a precarious situation and get them back on track. 65 years of age at the time of uh, metastatic breast cancer. Um, she recurred after having had her breast cancer, I think something like seven, eight years earlier. So it was a bit of a, uh, a long time. And unfortunately, um, she was a well woman, so she didn't really have a lot of symptoms until she started coughing. And a GP um, found that a course of antibiotics didn't work. She had scans, and there she had areas of collapse due to cancer, but a lot of little tiny spots in the lung due to cancer. She also had fluid around the, the lung, and she also had fluid around the heart. And that was probably also what contributed to her shortness of breath and so forth. Now, three years ago, most oncologists would have put her on chemotherapy. But with the data from six pivotal trials, and because she had a hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, I put her onto a CDK inhibitor. Fortunately, she was diagnosed at a time that these drugs were now on the PBS, so she didn't have to have a trial. Um, she's fabulous. Um, the spots in her lungs have diminished. Got a little bit of fluid here. No fluid around the heart. Living a normal life, going on trips, going on holidays. And then this was a younger patient, and this is the important thing to know. So with some of the hormone treatments, it's only um, effective in older postmenopausal patients. So we were really uh, pleased to be involved in the Mona Lisa 7 trial, a bit of a plug for the CDK inhibitor ribocyclic, because out of the six or seven international trials of CDK inhibitors, they chose to do a trial in younger women. They didn't want younger women <clears throat> with metastatic breast cancer to miss out on the possibility that a CDK inhibitor would work. So the design of this trial was she had an injection to turn off her ovaries, and then she got the CDK inhibitor and a hormone drug. So she had a large lump in the breast at the time of diagnosis. So that's there, there, between those two crosses. That is all cancer. You could feel it. You can see compared to the last bone scan, <coughs> A lot of bone disease, pelvis, back, and so forth. She's still on the trial now. I believe she might be one of about 15 patients that are remaining on the trial, which is now closed, the drug is registered, and she's going strong at more than five years. So certainly a, a, an effective um, drug that is for both younger and older women with uh, metastatic breast cancer. So I thought I'd just give you an update because you always want to know what I'm doing and making sure that I'm concentrating on metastatic breast cancer. So we currently have 32 active ongoing trials. This is actually old, this slide. I think we're up to about 124 clinical trials that I've now done over the last um, 20 years or so. 23 of our trials are focused on metastatic breast cancer. And I hope that gives you a lot of encouragement um, that we're spending um, you know, that kind of attention to obviously areas of unmet need. We've got, um, some of you may know about the drug fulvestrant, which is a hormone um, uh, agent, but it has to be given as injection into the bottom. Not particularly nice. And I would say that particularly for Amanda, who has to give it. Um, so we have three uh, trials looking at the same class of drug as fulvestrant. So fulvestrant is a SIR, a selective estrogen receptor degrader. And we've got three trials looking at old uh, formulations. And we're hoping that, you know, this is going to, they're not, they're, they're all early stage phase, phase one, phase dash, phase two trials. So it'll be still a while before they go into a registration mode, but hopefully we'll contribute to that. We have one immunotherapy trial at the moment with two, one definitely opening in a couple of weeks and a third possibly opening um, <coughs> in the next month. We have trials of anti-HER2 drugs. So we've got a trial with tocatinib, the drug that gets into the brain, so we're quite pleased about that. We have a drug in the early breast cancer setting of an, a new anti-HER2 drug, so we're excited about that. We're very excited with Francoise. Is Francoise here? No. no. Okay. Um, Francoise and Mary are our fabulous clinical psychologists, and Francoise is helping me with our second study in children 
uh, where we're actually going to look at interventions to try and help um, children of women with breast cancer aged between 14 to 24 reduce their level of distress. Because in our first study, we found uh, over 30% of children uh, in that age group had significant distress as a result of their mother's cancer. We finished our fatigue trial. So that's on my cards to analyze. And we've got a number of basic science trials that I think are really exciting that I'm doing with my colleagues at Curtin University. I think that's it. Hang on, let me just check. Yes, that's it. Any questions? Can you go from one steady pay drug to another? Like how many are in that list? There are three CDK inhibitors. Uh, currently, there is no good evidence that changing from one to the other, because the first one has stopped working, is effective. You certainly can change from one to the other to the third if you're not tolerating that particular CDK inhibitor, and that's allowed uh, on the PBS. We have one trial that we uh, are probably going to open in a few months' time where they actually um, are suggesting that they will allow women on CDK inhibitors when they progress, as long as they've responded for about six months, to then go on to their new drug and a CDK inhibitor. And I know that from talking to my international colleagues, uh, have a patient on a CDK inhibitor and a hormone drug, when the cancer stops responding, keeping the CDK inhibitor consistent and changing the hormone drug. So a lot of, a lot of research is being done. You know, We want to get the most out of this family of drugs because they're pills, they're generally quite well tolerated. We want to keep on using them in the patients who benefit from them. Um, why is it that you have situations where <coughs> a drug might be replaced in a trial? So in the US, it uses a certain drug as part of a three-pronged effect or whatever, but in Australia, one of those drugs is replaced by another drug, but it's the same. Trial. Have you got an example? Yes, I do. I can show you. Um, it's um, to do with the PIC3 um, mutation. Alpalicid? Yes. So that's been replaced by um, capofessin or something. Okay. All right. So with some of these targeted treatments, so alpalicid is the PIC3 kinase inhibitor, um, there has been some... Uh, Concerns. How can I, put it? I don't know whether this is the reason for the, the replacement in that in that trial, but there's been some concern in terms of the, the tolerability of that drug. It causes a very very high rate of diabetes. It can have impact on liver function tests as well. Uh, we are involved in an alpha-lipid trial here as well, but it's just impossible. I've, I've, had, I've screened six patients and none of them were eligible for the trial because it's got a very very tight criteria. There's also some evidence that um, different uh, PIK3 inhibitors of the PIK3 pathway uh, can be more effective. So um, in that situation, the trial that you're talking about, the pharmaceutical company owns the patent for both. So they have the ability to, to switch. If you had to involve another company, sometimes that's much more difficult. So if something is being changed, so for instance, we had a trial which was really disappointing. We, it was, uh, we were involved in both of the trials that got uh, reported, and one of them was actually reported um, last year at the big uh, American uh, meeting, and it met its endpoint. It actually helped women to live longer lives. Um, and so everybody was very excited. This was the new, it's an oral chemotherapy. Uh, I had several patients on the trial. Um, and unfortunately, even though the trial met its endpoint, and partly this could be to do with the American politics, you know, and lack of money and COVID and all the rest of it. The FDA declined approval and basically said to the company, you can try again, but we can tell you we're never going to approve the drug. I have never been involved in a clinical trial where as a result of that American FDA decision, the company actually closed down. Within a week of that decision, and they let me know because they knew I was part of the the, the team that did the, the pivotal trial, they said to me, look, we've, I've, we've sacked 250 uh, staff members. Uh, our money's going to run out. Our drug's going to stop working. Um, and so I've got three patients on their trial. Um, and so basically we've got <coughs> access to the most number of pills that they can give us, which is for another 18 weeks, and then it's no more. And that's just... 
It's heartbreaking because the company's <coughs> completely disbanded. They have no more staff. No one's going to pick up the drug to try and, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot, a lot of time by everybody involved yeah. for a drug that actually worked. And I thought it was actually really kind of a niche kind of drug. Did they state the reason? Yes. Reason? So unfortunately, and unfortunately it's always easier to look back in retrospect, because of the nature of the trial, um, and it was a relatively new American company, they actually um, opened the trial in a number of centres. I'm not going to bias you as an audience as to which region it is, but it was in a region of the world where they don't have a lot of... I can put this very catch, right? Uh, they weren't the highest level of robustness in treating patients in clinical research. So, unfortunately, the women that were put on the trials at those centres got some pretty nasty side effects. So much so, it actually overwhelmed the side effects in general. Um, we did really well here. All the patients thought it was a really good drug. Skewed the and it skewed the results. The safety signal came from essentially, I think, three, re three hospitals. And it's not a criticism of the doctors, you know, I'm sure they would have done the best to take care of their patients, but maybe they, you know, weren't used to getting in quickly and there was, there was uh, one death, um, but it was, dis it was uh, adjudicated as possibly related to the cancer rather than to the drug, uh, but side effects was just too unacceptable. That was what the, the reason the FDA used which I actually question as well, because they approve a lot of other drugs, which have a lot of other side effects. So I just wonder whether they, you know, cited that as a reason, but they just didn't think it was going to work. And would you get genetic factors, racial genetic factors? That yeah, uh, and that's a good point, because, um, you know, in the days when I used to do a lot of travelling, which I'm so pleased I don't, I can't now, um, uh, there is absolutely differences in particularly Asian patients, not so much uh, black Americans, um, uh, but Asian patients have a different metabolism because a lot of these oral drugs are metabolized through the liver. Um, and so I've, we've tried many times to try and initiate collaborations with my friends in Malaysia and in Hong Kong to try and do trials. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, interest in doing a trial looking at safety issues when the drug is already out there. Mm. And the drug is out there because 95% of the patients were Caucasians, so they knew what the safety profile was. And so if Asian patients get more side effects, you couldn't really pick it up very well. What about Indigenous uh, ladies, Arlene? Because we know that, that they have... Yeah, I think part of the problem is that they make up a very, very small cohort of uh, trial recruitments. I think and part of that is the distance, um, is the belief system, whether they want to be in a, in a clinical trial. And really, you know, one of the things that um, doctors have to do, and we don't have a crystal ball, but one of our requirements is we have to explain sufficiently to the patient to say, you know, we want you to go into this trial, but we need a commitment from you. You know, so women need to have the information to process, but they have to say, look, I want to be committed to it. And sometimes you go into a trial, it's a placebo control trial, they're getting best standard of care, but they're not necessarily getting the new drug. They think because they don't have any side effects. That might opt for them to, to come off. But more commonly is if you go into a trial where it's an open label trial, half the women get the best standard treatment, half the women get the best standard treatment and the drug, so everybody knows, doctors and patients know who's getting what. There's also an issue that the patients in the control arm say, look, there's nothing in it for me, you know? And so sometimes they come out of the trials. So if we have that problem with just general population, it's going to be even a bigger problem um, with Indigenous people because it's a big commitment. It's a lot more travel, potential for side effects. They really have to have the ability to understand what the advantages are, are for them. To have access, to have funding so that you can go to them, the accessibility. Really hard because, you know, it's not just a matter of travel. You need to have the support systems. You know, if you want to do a trial with a new drug, you need to be able to support that individual in the community. Yeah. What if they don't have a hospital? What if they have an emergency department? You know, you, you, and you can't. You know, one of the, the basic prim, um, requirements of doing clinical research is do no harm. Mm. You, can't, you can't involve a patient, even if you think it's the best thing for them, if the your social circumstances are such that they may be at a higher risk of harm. And I think that's the biggest problem. I mean, I have patients from the uh, who are in regional areas that say, look, I'd really like to do it, but I just can't commit to the travel. And that's a, you know, that's a discussion and decision that we make together.
I think I've hit the mark. It's 12 o'clock. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, Amanda, do I have to give any notices? There's tea and food. There's tea and drinks and uh, food up in the, in the back room. Thank you for your support. See you here next year.